pause for that moment and ask for God's good blessings on the food that we are about to share. Uh, blessings upon the, those who bring the food to our tables uh, and the beverages of our choice, that we thank them for their service. Bless all who gather here in the City Club under the leadership of Jay Doherty that brings together the city that we love by this lake on the prairie of Illinois, the intelligence and the integrity of people of goodwill seeking to better the life of all and we call in Chicago and the county of Cook and the great state of Illinois. We keep in our prayers our brothers and sisters in Haiti, those who have been devastated by the power of an earthquake, the death and destruction and the suffering, but we're also, Lord, thankful uh, for the power of love from the collective generosity of countries around the world, our own great country, charitable organizations, people of different faiths, of different professions, coming to the assistance of our brothers and sisters upon that island. We continue our prayers for the men and women of our military, that they are not forgotten, especially those who are in harm's way in the war in Iraq, in the war in Afghanistan, for families who miss them and worry about them. We keep a prayer for those who have been wounded, for families to help heal them, and our country does not forget them. And we humbly pray for those who have sacrificed their very lives in service to our country. Bless them all. Bless the United States of America. Amen. Our guest today is the director of the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. He was born in Rockford, Illinois, and, graduate, and graduated from Rockford East High School. Our guest today earned his bachelor's degree with honors from the University of Tulsa and graduated with honors from Marquette University Law School. He served as a state representative from 1995 to 2001 and was elected mayor of Rockford in April 2001. During his tenure as mayor, air passenger service returned to the greater Rockford airport and steps were taken to encourage industrial development adjacent to the airport and the nearby Interstate 39 corridor. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, Doug Scott. Doug? Well, thank you very much, Jay, and good afternoon. It's great to be back at the City Club again. I think it's my third time uh, speaking uh, to you, and it's, uh, it's always great. I really enjoy the, the City Club, uh, try to come as often as I, as I can just to hear the other speakers, and I always enjoy the questions and the great uh, exchange of ideas. It's a wonderful uh, thing that, Jay, that you and the board have, have uh, done and continued to do over the years, and so I really appreciate the chance to come back. It's always great to see uh, Professor Green, and I know you guys have probably not gotten tired of the campaign or anything at all, so, uh, so the professor and I will debate the uh, legitimacy of township government, I think, uh, <laughs> for you today. Well, just kidding. No, that, we won't do that. <laughs> it's always a roast when you're here, Paul. Well, I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about some of the issues that, that we're facing and actually spend most of my time today talking about climate. Uh, uh, which I know for a lot of you in the audience is something that you're already preparing for, already working on, uh, already lobbying in one, uh, one level of government uh, or another and are preparing for a, a mixture of regulation and, and statutory uh, changes that are coming uh, through different levels of government. And I think it's really important for us to try, I'll try as best I can to try to sort out all of the, uh, all of the moving parts uh, of that particular issue uh, and I'll spend a few minutes doing that. But first, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the other issues that the agency is working on at any given time. Uh, as, I, as I know from talking to a lot of you coming in today, uh, there, are, there are myriad uh, issues that the agency is, is working on. We're doing that uh, as our other state uh, and local agencies, obviously, uh, in the midst of uh, some fairly severe budget uh, issues. And even though uh, the, the Illinois EPA doesn't uh, get any general fund dollars at all, we're fairly unique among among uh, our sister agencies in other states, uh, we still feel the, the impact of the budget cuts. We have fund sweeps and, and other things that end up taking away uh, some of the dollars that we have. And, and when the economy is down, a lot of the fees that support a lot of the programs that we have, those are also down as well. And so we've had a, a fairly significant uh, downturn uh, recently. 
Uh, some of you I know are familiar with a lot of the programs in, in our land bureau that are some of the very popular programs that unfortunately we've had to put on hiatus for this year and uh, recently had to reassign uh, 31 employees from land into other bureaus to be able to try to uh, keep them employed and do some of the work that's necessary in the other areas where they can uh, actually uh, afford to, to have them. And, and uh, again, even though we don't have any general fund dollars, it's, uh, it's still going to be rough. Just to kind of put it in perspective uh, for you, we have under 900 employees now. Uh, when I came four and a half years ago, that number was about between 11 and 1,200. Uh, so in a very short period of time, we've had a fairly dramatic decrease. That number's down. Uh, from about uh, 1,300 to 1,400 that existed there eight years ago. So you can see a fairly dramatic uh, downturn in the number of employees that are there. And, and uh, you know, the, the reality is that we're not doing less than we were doing eight years ago. We're doing as much or more. A lot of it's different, but uh, we're doing uh, as, as many or more functions as we were doing, uh, doing before. Uh, and just to kind of put this, this whole, I know you're going to hear a lot about this, uh, over the next several months, uh, both from the campaign and also from the legislative session. But just to kind of put into perspective uh, the general fund budget deficit and why it's having such an impact, not just on general fund agencies, but on the rest of us who have other funds that get tapped to, to plug general fund holes. Uh, the general fund deficit, depending on, on who you talk to, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 to $12 billion uh, for the state right now. Uh, if you took the cuts that were made last year, uh, which was about a billion dollars in cuts. If you took that billion, added it to the tax increase that the Senate actually passed and laid off every state employee, every state employee, uh, you'd still be about $4 billion short. And so the real discussions that have to come in terms of not just agencies like mine but that, that depend on a lot of funding, but some of the big areas, uh, we talk about corrections, we talk about direct aid to school districts, uh, you talk about human services, and so these are very, very difficult times, and so all of us feel that, uh, even in agencies that aren't directly funded uh, by the general fund. Uh, at the same time, where, uh, where we're feeling those budget crunches, and we're not alone, and there, there were two states this year that started their budget preparation uh, that didn't have a deficit, you know, North Dakota and Montana. Uh, the, the other 48 of us, uh, Misery Loves Company, we're all trying to deal with, with less resources. Uh, just like local governments are, uh, other states are trying to do the same, uh, same thing. And at the same time that that's happening, we've got a much more aggressive, I think those of you that deal with them uh, on a day-to-day -day basis would know that this is true, a much more aggressive United States EPA. Uh, many of us in the states think that that's a good thing, uh, like the directions that they're going, but the fact that they're that much more aggressive puts a lot of new requirements on us and a lot of new things that we have to be looking at, uh, which we're fine with, but obviously it also plays into the resource issues that, that we have as well. Uh, so you've got a lot of new air standards are getting more aggressive on toxic substances, for example. Uh, we're, we're dealing now with, uh, in addition to what we're dealing with from the federal government, uh, new regulations concerning uh, animal feeding operations or the larger farms that are out there, uh, e-waste and the disposal of that, the disposal of pharmaceuticals, uh, and the federal government, uh, as I said, taking a much more aggressive line on toxic substances, which will also have more implications for the, for the states. And, and in addition to that, uh, based on uh, some incidents that happened uh, last year, we've, we've also increased in the state our right to know provisions, so we're notifying more and more communities of more and more things that, that even though they may not have immediate uh, health uh, risks associated with them, they have the potential for building into a situation that has immediate health risks for them, uh, and so we're notifying more communities of more and more things. So that's kind of the backdrop that, that we're operating under right now. We're trying to, to do additional things with watershed planning and, and a lot of other issues uh, that are very, very important to us and to a lot of you I know in the room uh, as well. Uh, we count on our partners a lot. It's great to see Suzanne here. Uh, we work very well with the city of Chicago, and I tell people uh, very, very often that uh, in, in my counterparts in other states that uh, it's really nice uh, to have uh, the largest city in your state uh, operated uh, under a government where the mayor wants to be one of the greenest mayors, uh, if not the greenest mayor in the country. That, that makes our job and our working relationship with the municipal government in Chicago a uh, very, very good one. And so we're, we're, we're very pleased with that relationship. And Suzanne, thanks for all you do uh, with us. One of the great news uh, items that we had uh, last year was the, the uh, 
Recovery Act, the stimulus funds brought a lot of new dollars to the state uh, in terms of wastewater and drinking water projects that we were able to, to work on. A lot of that money ended up uh, here in the city. A lot of it ended up uh, at MWRD. A lot of it ended up with some of the suburban um, wastewater and drinking water providers here in the area, and that was very, very uh, needed. We were able to provide those dollars. A, a quarter of it is just, just a grant. Uh, three quarters of it at zero percent interest, which for all of these municipal governments that are struggling, uh, their residents are struggling, uh, not having to pay back that interest uh, is something that saved a lot of these communities literally millions of dollars over the course of those loans. And so that's something that we were, we're very pleased to be able to provide. It got us about 260 million extra dollars between those two programs. Uh, we were able to combine that with last year's allocation of our funds and wastewater and drinking water programs uh, and really provide uh, over 100 communities uh, with some really, uh, really comprehensive uh, programs to help them uh, bring their infrastructure up to date, uh, which, is, which is very, very important on so many levels. Uh, of course, there were time limits attached to that because it was uh, designed to be uh, shovel ready was the uh, was the term that everyone uh, kind of wore out uh, with the stimulus. Uh, so all of our projects have to be out the door by February 17th, which is a deadline we'll make, and we're hoping that we'll be able to, uh, to to actually get into some of the dollars from people that weren't able to meet that that deadline as well. So hopefully that's something that we'll be able to do uh, as well. And there's talk in in Washington of another. Uh, if not, they probably won't call it a stimulus, but another uh, injection of funds into the water, uh, wastewater and drinking water programs, which would be very, very helpful to all of us. Just to give you kind of an idea, uh, we said we got about $260 million uh, in new funds uh, that came through the stimulus funding. We had $3 billion in requests from communities throughout the state, all with projects that they thought they could do within the time frames that were provided by the stimulus. And so this, is, and again, we're not unique in this. This is a phenomenon that's going on throughout the country. Uh, and so those funds uh, become very, very important uh, to, as a way to upgrade. Uh, we're finding districts where there's a tremendous water loss, a huge issue in the northeast part of our state uh, where water scarcity is becoming a real issue in the collar counties. We're finding a tremendous loss of water resources with just because of old pipes and old systems. And so replacing those uh, takes on not just a, an efficiency standpoint, but also saves some folks a, a lot of money and saves a precious resource of, of water as well. So those are some of the things that, uh, that have been occupying our, our time uh, recently. And I want to spend uh, the, the bulk of the time today and, and again, look forward to the questions. There are so many areas we can, we can talk about, so I really look forward to, uh, to trying to answer as, as many questions as I possibly can. Uh, but on climate, uh, obviously this is something which, uh, where I spend a lot of my time uh, working uh, with the various agencies and the other levels of government trying to determine uh, what course of action the, the, is going to be taken, not just locally and regionally, but also on the, on the uh, national and international level. Uh, there are literally dozens of moving parts uh, all at the same time on this. And I know a lot of you, I was talking to a couple of you uh, before I came up here, trying to figure out um, you know, what, what direction this is ultimately going to go. Um, if, you, if you're able to do that, um, there's probably a career for you somewhere else. Um, uh, because if you can adequately pro uh, project where this is going to end up, uh, uh, there, there's probably a good job for you somewhere because it's very, very difficult. I think the short answer is that climate uh, regulation, greenhouse gas regulation is, is, is going to be coming. Uh, and, and so the, the best thing that, that you can do for that is prepare for that. Know what your own uh, output of those are. Know where you may be able to uh, to play a positive role in the market. Uh, perhaps you're not going to be an entity that's going to be covered by greenhouse, greenhouse gas regulation. You may have the ability to uh, do some things that uh, not only provide efficiency in your own operation, but may allow you to actually sell some credits on the market and, and have a positive uh, economic impact for your particular company. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll try to do this by group as much as I can. We'll start with international. Uh, I had the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the good fortune to be able to uh, be at the uh, Copenhagen, uh, the the conference of the parties, as it's known, the the UN. Oh, thank you very much. The uh, the UN uh, talks, uh, which is uh, uh, which is really a a fascinating uh, exercise uh, for those of you that have had the. Uh, right down there, we don't want water spillage after I just talked about conservation. So. Um, <laughs> For those of you that have had the opportunity to, to 
find yourself in any piece of this international negotiation. It really is fascinating. Uh, not always good, but always fascinating. Um, I can't think of a, uh, a worse way to try to negotiate a really complicated treaty amongst almost 200 countries than the way that has been set up to do this. Um, and again, logistically, the people in Denmark were fantastic and everything they touched was great. Uh, if you're hosting a large party, even a group this size, I would recommend you not have the UN plan it, um, <laughs> just logistically. Um, because the, in terms of trying to fit uh, 40,000 credentialed people into a building that, that housed 15,000 maximum creates lots of, of difficulties, as you can imagine, and lots of people who thought they should be in the building uh, if not in the room where negotiations were going on uh, that were left out. And so it made for some very difficult, uh, very difficult circumstances there. Um, but um, just to try to put in context for you how this happens, you've got, you've got 192 countries roughly that, that participated in this. At one point there were as many as 130 world leaders that were actually uh, in Copenhagen for all or for part of this. Uh, they all got up and made speeches in supposed five-minute increments. Uh, try putting a five-minute clock on, on a head of state. It uh, doesn't matter what country it is. That's a very difficult thing to do. But you would see bizarre things, like uh, we were told of one uh, head of an African uh, nation who came there and was scheduled for Tuesday evening to be the 20th speaker after midnight. So you think nobody's watching C-SPAN when Congress is doing those orders of the day? This is even, this is even worse than, than that. In the meantime, all the diplomats are off doing what they're really been working on nonstop, which is to try to come up with a, with a treaty process for that. That got complicated by, by the heads of state, actually, that were there, except for President Obama. And um, he came in on the uh, next to last day uh, of, the, of the meeting. And, you know, like the president or not, I happen to like him uh, an awful lot, but uh, he had uh, the ability to walk into rooms, even in meetings where he wasn't technically invited to, uh, and actually sit down and to try to hammer out some basic principles that people could leave Copenhagen with. If he hadn't done that, uh, I think he pretty much would have left Copenhagen with nothing, uh, which would have been a, a real bad statement uh, internationally as well. Here's a couple of the things that came from that that are important. One is targets. Uh, the, all of the nations, for the first time, actually have put targets uh, in uh, to an international negotiation, including the United States. We may disagree with some of the stringency of some of those targets. We may say China's aren't enough, uh, China says the United States aren't enough, but the idea that, is that everybody is now playing in that, in that arena. Everybody has put targets in. And the Chinese, for the first time, agreed on verification. They didn't just say, trust us, we'll hit the, the levels that we tell you we're going to hit. Uh, that's very important as well. The dollars for uh, those nations that are already and will continue to suffer from the effects of, of climate change, principally uh, poor uh, nations in Africa and South America, uh, the money that is supposed to be raised by the other nations to go there uh, is very important as well, and that really kept uh, a lot of the negotiations going forward at a time where that looked dif uh, very difficult. There's a lot left to do, obviously, and that, that leaves a lot in between. Um, but there are, the diplomats are working on that uh, during year-round negotiations, and so I think that that's something where, where we're going to continue to see at least some more progress uh, at a time where mid-week mid through the second week in Copenhagen, it looked like nothing was actually going to, to happen from that. Uh, obviously, the president believes in this, brought it up again during his State of the Union uh, address and in his meeting with the Republican uh, leadership uh, or members on Friday. Did any of you have a chance to see that? That was one of the more remarkable things I think I've ever seen, being a political science major and wonk, uh, to see a president walk in to a, a meeting of, uh, an issues meeting with the other party by himself uh, and uh, answer their questions was, was truly amazing and, and was not only good TV, but I think it's good for policy and it's, I think it's good for, for continuing uh, relations uh, going, going along. But at any rate, he continued his, his pledge toward uh, energy and, and, and climate uh, uh, progress there uh, as well. 
He's a very big believer in clean energy technology, which is incredibly important. Uh, we not only want to invest in the technologies of the future, um, but we want to be able to build some of those things here. Uh, there's no reason why with all the wind turbines that are being put up uh, from all of the states who are working on renewable portfolio standards uh, that we can't be building those uh, in the United States and we can't be building them in the Midwest where we already have a tremendous infrastructure uh, for manufacturing and if you come from Rockford like I do and your unemployment rate is 17 percent and that's driven a lot uh, by things like loss of manufacturing jobs, uh, you see the real need behind trying to, trying to push uh, for that. Uh, and for things like energy independence, and he mentioned uh, nuclear power uh, as well, uh, as something, he put that back uh, on the table again. But a lot of this uh, centers around the whole idea that, that the economy uh, can actually uh, be enhanced if we do this correctly, if we do our energy uh, and climate policy correctly, and I'll talk about that again uh, in, a, in just a minute. Obviously, the House passed a, a climate bill. The Senate has one that has gotten through uh, one committee, uh, but now you've got the group of uh, Senators Kerry uh, and Graham and Lieberman uh, working on a bipartisan effort trying to come up with something. Uh, they say they want to still do that this year. The timing of that's a little tough because you've got to finish health care first, which has obviously taken longer than anybody anticipated, then go back into financial re-regulation, uh, and then try to get to climate. You've got the elections coming up. Uh, that, that one may be difficult to do. Uh, but as they're talking about that in Congress, US EPA is not waiting. Uh, they have come through with, with several different uh, um, rules uh, that they have put forward, including uh, one on mandatory reporting uh, of greenhouse gases. Uh, that's, that's one that was widely anticipated and was, was a carryover, something that was actually going to happen uh, during the Bush administration. It got delayed a little bit and has just now uh, come out. So there are a lot of people, companies, uh, either your companies or for those of you who represent entities, uh, they're going to have to start reporting their greenhouse gases to the federal government uh, if they're not doing it to their state governments uh, already. Uh, then the endangerment finding. The endangerment ba finding basically says that, that uh, CO2 um, is a pollutant. Uh, that has negative health consequences. And when the US EPA issues that ruling, that triggers a number of other things along the way because then those of us who run programs for the federal government uh, have to start interpreting that in, in that way. We have to start looking at carbon in the permits that come before us uh, to see uh, how carbon is being accounted for uh, in the releases that come from, from the companies. Uh, and then a tailoring rule, uh, which doesn't have anything to do with clothes. Uh, it actually is tailored uh, toward larger companies, larger emitters, uh, such that the, the permits that have to come uh, from these companies now that we issue for, for, uh, for air permits, for example, uh, for large emitters of 25,000 tons or more of carbon during the course of the year uh, are going to have to start accounting for that in the permits that, that we do for them. That's going to bring in a lot of people uh, to get permits uh, that aren't currently getting permits and a lot of people that already are to have to do something different uh, with that as well. Uh, all of those will be litigated, uh, of course, uh, and so that, uh, that uh, although may not be stayed, uh, so they may ac actually take effect while they're being litigated, but again, that affects how we do business and effect will affect how a lot of you do business uh, as well. And during this whole time, during the, during the previous administration, when not a lot was happening, uh, in terms of climate uh, uh, on the national level, either in Congress or, or from the White House, uh, states and regional governments were starting to act and local governments were starting to act. I, I was here when, when Suzanne uh, presented uh, Chicago's uh, plan and the progress that they had made on, on greenhouse gases. Uh, and a lot of other cities were doing that as well. A lot of states were doing that at the same time. Illinois was one of them. Uh, we came up with a climate action plan. The last time I was here, we had just finished that, and I, I talked about uh, the, some of the recommendations uh, that were included in that. Uh, there are actually 24 uh, different recommendations, many of which have already been put into place. Things like a renewable portfolio standard. So those who are selling electricity or, pro or producing electricity in the state, they're uh, uh, their portfolio now will have to include uh, a substantial amount of renewable energy uh, as the years go on. An energy efficiency standard that will also mandate that we come up and the, the, uh, the utilities and others working together come up with programs uh, to help pick that low-hanging fruit of energy efficiency, trying to do things like more weatherization, working with businesses to try to have more efficient uh, processes, things like working with 
water and wastewater treatment providers is something that we're doing, making sure their operations are energy efficient as well because they're large users of, of electricity. Uh, all of those things are, are things that are designed uh, that came out of that, um, that Illinois Climate Change Advisory Group, those recommendations that are now into law, uh, as well as things like uh, those who uh, are going to put forward uh, electricity uh, in the future will also have to look at uh, and do so by, by burning coal, we'll also have to look at a carbon capture and sequestration uh, standard as well. And Illinois, of course, uh, working with FutureGen, it's amazing. Uh, the, when Illinois was selected as the site for FutureGen, which is a, a low uh, emit carbon emit emitting uh, coal uh, uh, fired power plant, uh, when Illinois was selected for that uh, over a site in Texas, uh, amazingly, the Department of Energy cut funding off during the last administration. There was some guy from Texas that was influential in the last administration. Just a guess on my part. Uh, that that uh, has now started back up again. And there, we've got some renewed interest and some renewed hope that, that future gen will actually be back on the table. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier of trying to provide for those next generation uh, technologies as well. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot uh, that, that has been put into place and many other uh, parts of the, the Illinois plan that have actually been put into place through legislation. Of course, the centerpiece for that uh, was a cap and trade program for Illinois, uh, much as what we're talking about on the, on the federal level uh, as well. Interestingly enough, we talked about the economics of that earlier, and that's where you're going to hear a lot of this debate over the next several months or even years as this plays out. The interesting thing that we found, and it was very interesting to us because, frankly, I expected to find something a little bit different, but in working with the modelers who were modelers who worked for principally for, for business and, are, and were chosen in part because they're, they're very conservative in terms of how they do this, uh, we actually found that gross state product between now and 2020 would actually go up if we instituted a cap and trade program. The amount of jobs in the state would go up and the amount of money saved for consumers uh, would actually go up by about $3 billion a year by 2020 across residential, industrial, and commercial classes. Uh, we didn't, frankly, expect to, to find that. We thought we might find one of those pieces uh, in a positive way, uh, but the fact that all three of them were, uh, when we modeled cap and trade combined with all the other policies that I just talked about, the energy efficiency, the renewable portfolio standards, doing some more things with mass transit, uh, and other things that you're seeing through the capital bill right now, um, we actually found that there, there can be a positive economic impact to that. And so I think you're going to see um, things like that be, be a large part of the debate uh, going forward. Uh, and a lot of not just states were doing things, but regions were doing things as well. Started off in the Northeast, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, uh, known as REGI, uh, made up of 10 northeastern states. Uh, some Canadian provinces are there and some observers. Uh, have actually started selling carbon credits on the market. They've had a number of auctions for that. Theirs is a power sector only uh, program that they're, they're instituting, but there are people that are actually buying and selling carbon credits on a, on a mandatory market with the idea of having a compliance period coming up uh, in, to, in uh, 2012. Uh, so the Northeast states have really pioneered that and, and Reggie has gone forward with that. The Western Climate Initiative uh, started off being called Wedgie, figured that wasn't a very good thing, so. <laughs> So they went with Western Climate Initiative instead, uh, instead of Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Uh, the Western Climate Initiative is made up of seven uh, western states, uh, again, some provinces, some Mexican border states, uh, and some observers as well. Uh, and they are at the stage where they have put out all their design parameters, and they've been working on a model rule and legislation that they can have that all of the different entities can work under, as Reggie has, uh, to do their own regional cap and trade program. And of course, California has been a leader there and may actually get out ahead of Western Climate Initiative a little bit on, on this as well. But theirs is economy-wide. Theirs isn't just power plants. They're talking there about transportation. Uh, they're talking about other emitters of, of carbon uh, other than just power plants. And so uh, that will have a, a very uh, profound impact uh, as well. Then the Midwest states, there are six of us, uh, along with the province of uh, Manitoba uh, and three observers who have been working on the regional cap and trade program uh, as well. Uh, we are at the stage where the, the design parameters are done, the model rule is about done, it's going through a, a final vetting now. We actually did it a little differently than the other two groups did. 
uh, we actually have uh, got together the stakeholders and people that were in areas that were going to be affected by this up front and help develop the model rule with them. Usually, for those of you that, that hold this process near and dear to your heart, our stakeholder process is we come up with a rule and then we set it out and you guys can comment on it. We did it a little bit differently this time. We actually brought the stakeholders in and actually negotiated and worked on the rule as we, as we went along. And so we, we hope and we think that there's, there's a little bit more buy-in uh, to that than, than maybe through the normal process. Now, the other thing that's going on, obviously people say, well, why, why, you, why do you keep going? I mean, the federal government, obviously the president uh, feels strongly about this. Uh, you know, Congress uh, has passed a bill in the House and the Senate's still working on it. Well, as we talked about earlier, we really don't know exactly what's going to happen or when uh, Congress is going to act or, frankly, what that bill is going to look like at the time it does uh, pass uh, eventually. And so it's very important for us in the regions to put our information out there, to understand how a cap-and-trade program is going to affect us here in Illinois and the other Midwestern states so that we can not only understand what's happening to us federally but also help influence the federal debate as well. So you see not just a cap-and-trade program here for the Midwest, but you're also seeing us work on uh, a biofuels uh, uh, initiative where we can help promote biofuels, which is very important here to the Midwest. There's still a lot of people in the Northeast that have no idea what E85 is. Uh, we've been seeing it for a long time. We've been part of the plants that have helped to, to develop different biofuels, uh, biodiesel and others that we're using and are part of our economy right now. Uh, and so that's very important for us to have that be part of the, the federal debate, as well as the industries that are important to us here in the Midwest to be able to have a voice there to understand how these different programs are going to influence those particular industries. One of the examples that I give in, in the Midwest process, we spent a lot of time talking about the pulp and paper industry in Wisconsin, for example, a very high energy using industry that has tremendous competitive um, very small competitive margins such that uh, if we, depending on the type of system we, we where um, greenhouse gas credits get allocated or not or sold or not, uh, you could really have an incredibly harmful impact on that particular industry. Well, that's not only good for us to know as we develop a Midwestern program, but that's good for us to know as we go out and, and lobby and work with Congress in developing uh, a United States uh, program as well. And those three different regions, Reggie, the, the Western folks, and, and us in the Midwest, uh, have also begun working on linking all three programs. The idea behind doing a Midwestern cap-and-trade program instead of an Illinois-only program is that the larger the market, the better. That's the basic philosophy for that. Uh, that, that if we have a company uh, in Illinois and there's a company in Wisconsin as well uh, that, that uh, or maybe a company in Illinois also has a location in Wisconsin, it makes sense for us to have one coordinated regional program as opposed to different cap and trade programs. Well, that same logic holds if we try to, try to unite the three regions rather than having three separate markets. Uh, when we have an economy now where we have companies in all three of those areas that are, that are uh, that, that where we, uh, they may have locations in all three different areas. Uh, and so rather than having three different programs, uh, it makes sense to have one. It makes sense to us to have one big federal program. It makes even more sense for us to have an international program. Uh, but in, in the meantime, uh, the ability to start driving some of this technology, driving some energy efficiency, driving some of these other things that we know we have to get to anyway, uh, it makes sense for us uh, as a, on a regional uh, basis to continue. And, you know, folks aren't done. It's not just government that, that's, that's driving uh, these issues. It's some of the oversight boards that are government-related. I was talking to, to someone before about the, the SEC uh, guidance that came down last week that, that talked about companies now needing to disclose, uh, giving guidance as to, as to how they should disclose both uh, um, uh, carbon uh, liabilities that may accrue to the company uh, as well as uh, what we call adaptation, the cost of adaptation, which is reacting to negative impacts of, of climate change. If you're, in the, if you're on the coast of Florida and you've looked at Florida's adaptation plan, uh, which shows that uh, the vast majority of people who live within just a few miles of the coast, uh, if they see in, in sea level rise what they expect to see, uh, that substantial municipal urban areas are going to be gone uh, or underwater, uh, that now that now provides a backdrop for insurance companies, for the SEC and others to come in and start to say, uh, this is an area that, that corporately you need to, to pay attention to uh, as well. 
So there are a lot of, of different entities that are all playing in this. Again, the short, the short answer that I can give you is that, that these regulations are coming. And so the more that you can do to prepare your company for those that you represent uh, for this eventuality and, and get, in, get into the discussion, get into the debates that are occurring at all these different levels right now, uh, the, I think the better off uh, that you'll be. And so again, um, I, I tried as, as best I could to, to, to break that down. It's incredibly complicated and incredibly free flow right now, but uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea in terms of climate uh, as to what's happening out there, um, both locally and as far as internationally. Uh, with that, again, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to come, and, and I know you've got questions on a lot of other operations that we're in, and I'd be glad to take any questions that you have. Thank you. I was, I was going to do this, but Jay just reminded me, so um, I, 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 I didn't travel with a large entourage today, but I did travel with the most important entourage. Uh, uh, my wife Tammy is here, and, and Jay told me earlier, he said, you're going to introduce Tammy, and I said, well, I better, and he said, yeah. So, um, um, but um, for any of, any of you who have been in office, uh, um, Senator, and, and, and any of you who have been in these kind of public jobs, uh, uh, understand how really, really uh, important it is to have, have a, a spouse that's, that's willing to uh, see your name in the paper, and, and not always in a very flattering way, so, uh, uh, and to put up with the, with the hours and the other things. So um, Tammy's wonderful, and I really appreciate you being with me. Thanks. <laughs> Professor. You ready? I'm ready. All right, uh, get your water, you may need it. Water. You may need it. Well, late returns. Uh, How am I doing? About 50-50. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. <laughs> I'll take that. Lawrence Fieber from, uh, member of City Club, where are you, Lawrence? Raise your hand. Right in front, eh? Taking no prisoners. Burns and McDonald, um, any prediction about Fed state coal combustion waste disposal facility rulemaking and timing of rulemaking. The moderator has no idea what that's all about. <laughs> um, actually, ho hopefully I do, you know, so that's, yeah. Um, when, uh, for those of you that, um, that may have seen this in the paper, when, when there, the Tennessee Valley Authority had um, some ash ponds that uh, uh, they were associated with, with a levee that broke and ended up with, with some ash, uh, coal ash, ended up in places where nobody wanted it to be. Uh, the federal government, uh, on their own and also prodded by Congress, uh, as these things usually work, uh, came up with, uh, is working on coming up with some new regulations. They've been delayed uh, from where they, they wanted those to be. Uh, and I think um, the, the best prediction that I, can, that I can have with this is that we'll have some kind of a hybrid program. That mean, then the, the debate is whether uh, they will be treated, these ashes will be treated as a hazardous waste uh, or not. If they are, that pretty much puts out of business the really good beneficial uses that, that, that coal ash uh, can be used for. It's used in, in cement manufacturing and lots of other uh, processes, and, and we like that because that, that, that provides a beneficial use for the product. Uh, not all coal ash is fit for that, and I think there's going to be try to be some kind of distinction uh, between that. Um, I think that had that regulation been issued a few months ago, I think it's very likely it would have been come down on the side of being a hazardous waste. But I think the US EPA heard from enough folks, um, not just in the industry, but from other state governments uh, as well that work with a lot of these beneficial uses that uh, I think we'll end up with some kind of a hybrid system, which will probably still work for, for a lot of the ways that, that it's handled here. And again, part of the, part of the point there was uh, and we've gone back and rechecked uh, all of the containment areas where that's located in Illinois. That was more a failure of the containment area in, in Tennessee than it really was of the material that was there. And so, um, you know, hopefully we'll, 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 we've got our two cents in and hopefully uh, US EPA will come up with a system that allows us to still have these beneficial uses. Okay. Uh, Dick Lanyon, uh, Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. How is the agency going to issue, and of course we all know this, but some of you may not, the NPDES. <laughs> Neil, I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Permit for the next, why don't you read the question? How is the, how is the, how is the agency going to issue an NPDES, National Pollution Distribution Elimination System uh, Permit, for the next Rotenone application? 
Um, rotenone is the substance that was deployed into the sanitary and ship canal uh, to kill off the one Asian carp that it killed off. Um, <laughs> And to kill off, well, no, and we joke about that, and, and we all did internally, but, but the, the, the idea behind doing that uh, made sense. And for my folks at DNR, don't throw things at me. I know you're out there. Don't, don't throw anything at me. But uh, it, it actually made sense because the idea was to, st because the, the, um, the Army Corps, uh, the barrier that was there uh, was meant to be a temporary barrier. They haven't gotten the permanent barrier in, and so the temporary barrier actually needed to be fixed and upgraded. And so the rotenone was applied to stop any, any carp from, from getting into the lake during that time period where the barrier was being fixed. That's been, that's been done now. Uh, the NPDES permit, uh, actually the determination from us. What does that mean for some of us? NPDES is a, uh, is a permit that gets issued when people have a, a specific, uh, or excuse me, a non-specific discharge that ends up going into, into waterways that may end up, and that, that'll happen for us. Uh, um, we have uh, discharges that will end up coming in from uh, wastewater treatment plants, for example, and others. They all come under this. It's a federal permit that we administer for them. Uh, and, and the amount of any particular material uh, depending on what it is and where it is, um, there are certain limits that can happen for that. The determination was made uh, that Rotenone did not need, uh, by us and the feds, that Rotenone didn't need a, an NPDES permit. So that, uh, that we probably won't need one again if that's, if that's done. Nor did the potassium compound that was used as to mitigate the effect of the Rotenone once the fish kill was done. It's clear as mud. Lucky for you there's no exam. Okay, well. Uh Moving along in the same vein, we have several people, led by Joyce Saxon, City Club Board of Governors. Remember Joyce, right here she is. Where does your department stand on the Asian carp and closing of our locks? And I would add, has anyone found fault with the real culprit, the continent of Asia? Our uh, our agency is was not the was not the lead on the uh, on the Asian. CARP, as I said, the Department of Natural Resources were the folks that did that, and, and I think um, based on the decision that was made working in concert with the, the Corps of Engineer, uh, Army Corps, uh, actually did a very good job of, of managing that particular uh, portion of the, of, the, um, of the CARP issue. So that's not something that, that we're involved in other than uh, for the determination of, of how the rote known affected other um, other plant and, and human life uh, in, the, in that. So uh, I was with the, with the governor uh, when he was asked this question uh, on a couple of occasions, and, and you've seen what the attorney general uh, has put forth, and, and again, this is an issue that's, that's being debated this week by, uh, by governors at the White House uh, that'll be debated later this week with the, the people from the Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, it's a difficult issue for us because obviously from all the steps that we've been taking with the core and, and with the rote known, uh, obviously we don't want to see uh, the carp end up in the Great Lakes either. I mean, that has a, a tremendous um, uh, dilatory effect on, on recreational fishing and, 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 and business fishing uh, as well uh, as other uses of the, of the Great Lakes. However, uh, the, the sanitary and ship canal uh, also provides a tremendous uh, service uh, in terms of the moving of goods uh, in, our, in our economy. And so for our economy, that, that has a, a tremendous impact that we can't ignore. Uh, and so trying to juggle those two interests um, th there isn't any, any one answer that we've got because both of those, both of those uh, principles are incredibly important. So we're trying to juggle uh, as best we can. Uh, from our agency standpoint, we're not involved in that decision making so much. We're just there for the, um, the actual on the ground uh, problems or not that may be, may be created by any particular remedy. But um, I, I know that the governor feels very strongly about both those principles as well. He chairs the Great Lakes Commission. Uh, so you know he, he believes very strongly in the, in the Great Lakes, and we're trying to do what, as best we can working with the other governors, uh, the other attorneys general, uh, and the White House to try to figure out what the, what the best solution for that will be. It's not a great answer, but that's, uh, we're, we're trying to come up with the best solution that we can right now. All right, well, okay. Uh, now we have the quick 25 words or less. Okay. I, I know, you're no longer mayor, so 25 words or less. Yeah, right. Here we go. I know, I know. From, from, Former State Senator Art Berman, who asked, after you hear this question, you know why he was called Mr. Education. Could you explain the cap and trade bill? In 25 uh. words or less. 
whatever entities we're going for, whether in the, in the eastern states, it's just power plants, whether it's in the Midwest or the West, we're talking about more economy-wide, whatever, whatever area we're trying to reduce uh, carbon or carbon equivalent pollution from is set with a cap. Uh, then allocations can be made to particular industries under that, uh, but there is a cap, much like there is right now for acid rain credits for people who are involved in, in, and understand that, that process. And then there's a market set up for that, uh, such that those who exceed their cap have to buy credits on the market. Those who uh, are doing better than the, than the allocation for them are able to sell credits in the market. And those that aren't regulated who are providing good services, farmers who who put methane digesters in, for example, uh, people who do energy efficiency in a non-regulated industry. Those people who are creating uh, greenhouse gas reductions also may be able to sell into that. So it's a market-based system to establish a price of carbon and have people who are contributing in a good or, or negative way to that uh, to be able to play in that market. It wasn't 25. No, it was a good answer. And even the moderator now is going to break in and ask a question. As Jefferson once said, who censors the censors? Who provides the percentage, the allocation numbers? That's a, that's a great question, and that's, the, uh, that's the, the devil in a lot of the details that's out there. If you looked at the uh, Waxman-Markey bill that was passed in the federal government, uh, Mr. Waxman and Mr. Markey left the allocation system blank because that's where they wanted to use the negotiating ability to to the process that you so richly understand and comment on so well, the political process of trying to figure out where they could get enough votes to actually pass a bill. Uh, and so the allocations, that goes, and that, then that comes into things like the pulp and paper industry in Wisconsin or the cement industry. Where are all those, those industries that may be really negatively affected by that? How do we, how do we uh, help out consumers who may get hurt in the short term uh, by higher energy costs, even though we think in the long term they can be lower. How do we help those out? So allocations can be given for that. So it'll be, uh, in, a, in a legislative sense, it'll be the, the political bodies that end up making that decision. Boondoggle for lobbyists. That's a quick comment. Here we go. Neil Ross. This one you can answer in 10 words or less. Okay. Neil, uh, this is, you're a member. This is the City Club of Chicago. Where are you, Neil? Raise your hand. There you go, Neil. This is the City Club of Chicago, but you, you can do this. Why does it smell so bad in Gary? Can anything be done about it? <laughs> wow. Hey, not everyone's a lollipop. <laughs> um, well. <laughs> well done, Neil. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, <laughs> different, different, different industries will have different emissions that by themselves or in concert with other emissions in a particular area um, will let off odors that may not be harmful but might smell atrocious. A landfill is a good example of that. That if you go by and get near to the average working cell of a landfill, it probably won't smell the way it does, you know, in your living room, at least hopefully, right? So, um, and the reason for that is you've got the decomposition of garbage there. Uh, produces a sulfur kind of smell. Different industrial processes, whether it's, it's, it's making steel, as they, they did in Gary for a number of years, or different industrial processes, uh, the burning of things diff will, have, will uh, emit different, different emissions. Those are all regulated in one way or another uh, by, by the uh, Indiana Department of Environmental Management there, by the EPA in, in Illinois. Uh, by the federal government in, in many cases. So the, the fact that the, the, a particular smell of a particular city, and I've been all over Illinois and, and there are different odors that you can tell, and a lot of it you can tell based on what the industries are that are, that are in a particular place. Uh, where, where there's an ethanol plant, you've got a particular, particular odor from that. And a lot of it has to do with the manufacturing process that's there, what's being manufactured, uh, how often, in a landfill's case, how often it's rained recently? Do they have a gas collection system? There are a thousand different factors uh, for that, but it's, it, it generally has to do with what the industrial process is. And so in Gary's case, you've got, you've got a, a history of a lot of very heavy industrial uses uh, there in a very confined uh, area. And, and where you have that, whether it's in Gary or any other uh, you know, major industrial area, you're going to have uh, a similar collection of, of odors. All right. John.